Hey, um, hello, Phil. How are you? Ah, hi, Ed. I'm oh, great. I'm just setting up these these slides, getting ready to go. I don't know when yeah, the audience is going great. to arrive. Wow, I really like uh, this photograph. You know, uh, even though I've never been to to Aspen uh, or or the venue of uh, the normal venues in Plus now. Um, I have heard that it's uh, very, very beautiful, but uh, as of now, I don't know what I'm missing. So this, this photograph is really uh, uh, enticing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to get a photo that reminded of, of the actual physical venue for people that have been there uh, up in Aspen. So that is the restaurant uh, at the venue uh, to capture the restaurant theme, the, the a la carte part of our title. But we'll, we'll talk about that later when, when people actually arrive. Um what, what yeah, waiting? because you know, you? our our presentation title is quite a mouthful already. <laughs> I'm doing well, man. I, I, I really excited about this presentation. And um, it turns out that uh, I have a colleague from my team uh, at Snap, the augmented reality team. The name is uh, Alexander Bacherikov. And uh, tomorrow he will be presenting on uh, uh, techniques of uh, how to make uh, the standard template library algorithms expression templates. That is the title. And um, his work has inspired me to take uh, the zoo type operational library in, in that direction of, of uh, using expression templates to eliminate an, a lot of boilerplate code that uh, currently is needed. And so I have, I'm going to be working on that. So it's, I'm really happy about uh, having a, a, um, a promising direction to improve the type operation framework. Plus all of the things that uh, we have been talking about that already um, are uh, commenced and uh, that uh, are uh, yielding fruit. Oh, How are you at? Uh, that. Yeah. How are you at uh, being the developers advocate at uh, JetBrains? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a great job. I get to go to all these exotic locations to to give talks, like you know, Zoom, that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, Sealine just uh, sells itself really. So uh, that, that, that's a pretty good job. So anyway, I'm uh, still not quite sure when this talk is going to get started, but, you know, thinking about that, uh, that title slide. So yes. you know, there are some advantages to these virtual events. As, as you said, you know, you've not been to the venue before. A lot of people have never been able to make it there, but they can, they can be here at C++ now. now. But it's not virtual <laughs> events I have a problem with. It's the virtual keyword. Oh, yes. The public enemy of the virtual keyword and uh, the combination with uh, uh, intrusive referential semantics inheritance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's not all bad, even though I did do a talk at CVBCon last year called OO Considered Harm. I remember. Yeah. That's yeah, a, some... That is something that uh, um, I really liked uh, because uh, you introduced me to some programming techniques that are native to other programming languages. Mm -hmm. that I have been thinking how to incorporate into, into C++. But you know that I have also been working on uh, the part of um, a message passing uh, from different angles, like um, at uh, C++ now last year, uh, sorry, CPPCon last year, I mm -hmm. um, presented about uh, implementing a event processing right. that uh, if you want to do it with um, very good performance, it is like an interpretation of uh, object orientation message passing. And uh, I focused on the performance part of it. But um, yeah, C++ uh, London gave me the opportunity to share more about uh, this work. And uh, I also introduced uh, a few things that are more conceptual in nature, like um, why I think that um, what we want to do with uh, runtime polymorphism is uh, uh, implementing support for the Liskov substitution principle. Mm -hmm. uh, and that implies a relation of subtyping, but uh, implementing subtyping as subclassing is uh, a very heavy handed. So um, I think that we both have been working toward uh, the nature of uh, C++ runtime polymorphism has the, 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 the intrinsic feature is a uh, very take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. then um, uh, I'm very excited to, to, to work with you on uh, sharing with the audience uh, probably insights about uh, the other ways that other languages do polymorphism to see what we can recover for our own yeah. use in uh, C++. 
Yeah, no, um, I mean, we'll definitely get to that when the talk really starts. But I mean, while you're here, there was a slide in my CPPCon talk where I did show yeah, sort of a, a family tree of, of the languages that have had an impact on, on C++ in terms of OO, sort of all tracing back to our goal. And of course, you know, the procedural line continued down to C. And then similar is where we got the OO features from. But the interesting thing is there was a split where small talk went one way and C++ and I4 went, went a different way. Uh, so we got the, the C++ form of, of OO, which was um, much more natural progression, the evolution from, from what C gives us, whereas small talk was very, very different. And objective C was really a, a merging of uh, the OO interpretation from small talk with, again, uh, C, but rather than an evolution, it's much more of a grafting on top of the language. There's much more of a jarring distinction between uh, the, the C layer and the small talk layer, and very different syntax, which is what people notice most of um, most of all when they first look at the language. Uh, but actually underneath all of that, some very simple but yet powerful ideas, and very different to what we've got in C++. So I was trying to tease that idea that there are different ways of, of doing OO that have different trade-offs along the lines that, uh, that you've been uh, talking about. And actually the, the small talk and Objective-C approach is, is what's called message passing. Uh, and I've actually got, I've got some slides and I'm going to show you a bit later that- um, Oh yeah, please, please. Yeah. Uh, oh. I, I, I really like that this part of your presentation because this is the entry point that I, I, I didn't know about the small talk. And uh, this is the entry point that I got into understanding a, a more sophisticated message passing things to you. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to throw those slides in again. So I'm going to explain how the standard C++ approach to calling a method, uh, not a polymorphic method, just a straight method, is you basically just call a function. And it's just syntactic sugar that the compiler generates to co um, convert that into something that looks like a method call and passes this hidden this pointer in. We're all familiar with that. That's nothing particularly unusual, but it's um, nice to know that that's how it works under the hood. And then contrast that with when you go uh, the more dynamic with polymorphism, again, the, the built-in C++ way. Uh, it's basically the same. You've just got this extra level of indirection with, with the V table there. So it's got to look up the entry in the V table first before it can make the call. But otherwise, it's just still resolving to do a straight function call with a hidden this pointer again. Now contrast that with message passing. As in small talk and objective. Sorry, Phil. Could you go back? Uh, yeah. Could you go back one slide? Uh, mm -hmm. Because uh, you know, uh, uh, when you mentioned that part of the uh, extra indirection, mm -hmm. uh, most implementations of uh, a standard function, including, for example, uh, uh, varieties like uh, a Foley function and um, George Trulli's implementation, we remove this indirection by hoisting up to the object itself, the address of what we're going to be invoking. Right. So we already are like um, uh, at a standard function, we implementers have been uh, already um, kind of introducing elements that uh, deviate from, from the intrinsic feature of uh, virtual, in this case for performance. But uh, I, I want you to, to, to explain to everybody the part of um, a, a message passing. So uh, please hmm. go on. Yeah, no, you, you make a good point that we already have features in the language uh, in C++ that uh, deviate from this because they have to, really, because that that approach is not, not ideal for all situations. So I was contrasting it with message passing in Objective-C and small talk, And it looks very similar in usage once you get past the syntax. But what's, what's different is you what you're doing is you're passing a message to the receiver, the object that you're calling the method on, and that message basically is what we call a selector, the thing that tells it what method to call, and the set of arguments. But that goes to the object. And then the object is the one that uses the selector to locate the method and, and make the call, which at that point resolves down to a function call. But because the object has got there first, it can do something different. Most of the time, it just calls the method, so it looks very similar. But now you've got that extra dynamism in there, which- um, Quick question. Uh, yeah. When 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 uh, you do the same thing as uh, the invocation to a virtual table, is, is that what is called direct invocation in Objective C and a small talk? The direct invocation in Objective C is actually quite a new feature uh, since uh, I've been using the language, and it's it's actually a way to give you back more like the 
the C++ semantics, I believe. I've, I've not used it myself. So shortcutting that, um, that dynamic process in the name of performance. But what they found is in practice, they get very little extra performance out of it because this message passing approach, although it sounds like it's adding extra overhead and it, and it does, it's been optimized so heavily that it, at times at least it competes with uh, virtual dispatch in, in C++ in terms of performance while giving you lots of extra benefits. So it's actually quite interesting okay. to, to dig into that. Uh, and there is a, a hidden, well, it's called self in Objective-C, but same principle as, as this, you get that um, as well. But I think it's for all very well seeing that on, on a couple of slides, but I really wanted to do a little code demo to illustrate Oh yes, please. please. The benefits of this I love in Objective C. Demo. <laughs> Here we have a an Objective C header file. So, what we're doing is we're declaring a class here called Duck. <clears throat> By the way, because the syntax is so very different, I will have to just give like a very brief primer on Objective C. I'll try to make it quick. So, this is the interface for a Duck, and that's not an interface that we would normally be thinking of, like a separate uh, abstract base class or that sort of thing. This is really the interface of the class itself. So the, the class uh, declaration, if you like. And similar inheritance syntax, everything derives ultimately from NS object in Objective-C. It's a singularly rooted hierarchy. Um, and then we have a set of methods. So to introduce either with a minus for an instance method or a plus for a static or a class method. All the types in these method declarations are in round brackets, but there's no round brackets for the argument list. So they're just introduced with colons. We'll see those in a moment. So pretty straightforward once you get used to that syntax. Now this init is a special method, at least by convention. Uh, it's used for Objective-C's version of what we would call a constructor. If you have a look at that, you've got this weird thing where you have to call onto the superclass and uh, check self as well, because it can actually change the object itself in the constructor. So that's the first hint of um, dynamism that, that we, we get from this. And you can see the message passing syntax there in these square brackets. In fact, in small talk, it's without square brackets. They had to put those in to disambiguate from the underlying C layer. But I like to think of it as like the, the corners of an envelope that you put the message into that you're passing. So that's one way to think about it. But it looks much like a method of call. Um, and we, we could do anything else uh, to set up in there. And then the other, me other method on there, they're just logging to, to the console just so we can see what's happening. So that's duck. Then I've got a squirrel over here, very similar. There's the, the interface, we've got the init. I've also added a dialog. That's like the destructor. Now, Objective-C um, uses reference counting, but it used to be explicit with uh, explicit retains and releases, and you can still do that. But about 10 years ago, they introduced automatic reference counting. So it looks like garbage collection, but it is actually deterministic. Can't quite yeah. do RAI, it's not quite reliable enough. But, you know, uh, Phil, one thing that I that I keep seeing when I, I look at uh, runtime polymorphism, I mean, practically all languages, is uh, that very hard-coded, very deep assumption mm -hmm. of using referential semantics everywhere. And you know, as a C++ programmer, I'm really interested in the opposite part of uh, having most of the time value semantics for a number of reasons. And, and I will share with you uh, those reasons uh, in a moment, but uh, I just wanted to tell you that uh, it's amazing how referential semantics is pretty much inherent to all of object orientation, while I don't think that it should. That's a very good point. Objective-C is very much um, <clears throat> reference-oriented, um, heap-allocated, everything, all objects in Objective-C are by pointer to the point you don't have to use the arrow syntax, you can use dot because there is no other way to get at things. So that's very much baked into the language in Objective-C, but we'll, we'll see other examples later that differ. Um, just to complete this example, I've got this uh, eight method and a gather nuts method and a, a property, which is really just like an accessor. Um, it sort of synthesizes a, a getter and setter, although it's read only here, so we only get the getter. And if we have a look in these methods, you can see we're just doing a little bit more setting the number of nuts. And when you eat, it reduces the number of nuts you have by an amount from this call, and we'll get to what that's doing in a moment. So lots of syntax here. It's gonna look very unfamiliar, but hopefully you can see what these classes are, are trying to do. Oh, Let's have a look don't at some worry. 
Yeah. When people see the syntax of uh, affordances in the suit iteration library, they're going to panic and uh, run for the hills. But, uh, well, the, the, yeah, that's the way that uh, you can do something generic. I, I, won't, I won't tell them if you don't. All right. <laughs> All right. So here's, here's some test code. Now, this is actually using catch. Did you know that catch can test Objective-C? Yeah, we were talking the other the other day about it. That, uh, that was the yeah. primary motivation that you had to start doing the project. I'm very yeah, happy that it still works. It was originally an Objective-C test framework. Just happened to be written in C++ because you can do that. So if, you, if you're familiar with Catch, you'll, you'll be familiar with this. Now here's, here's where we're creating a squirrel. We've got this alloc init approach, just composing message passing calls. So it allocates memory and then calls that init method. And that's like our constructor. But it's all on the heap. Uh, we can check the number of nuts we start off with. Um, we can gather some nuts and just check that uh, we're, we're getting the right values there. We can eat uh, some nuts. It's just always going to be one at the moment. So it reduces by one and we're checking that. So, so far, nothing unusual, just different syntax for doing what we're already familiar with. Let's see how deep the squirrel hole, hole goes. <laughs> just to mix some metaphors there. <laughs> right. <laughs> What happens, first of all? You have quite a lot of on nuts to, it, 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 your nuts to do this, uh, uh, oh, a live yeah. demo like this. I'll, I'll resist the urge to go further with that metaphor. All right, let's set the squirrel, <laughs> let's set the squirrel to nil. Now, because um, we are using automatic reference counting, I mentioned earlier, at this point, that's going to deallocate the object. Compiler will actually insert the uh, the release call there for you as well. So after this point, there's no squirrel. It's it's gone, deceased. What happens then if we make a call on, on the squirrel? And I'm just having trouble typing around my mic. But So if we make that call to get the number of nuts, now what would we expect to happen? Some sort of crash, maybe. But in fact, I'll just bring that up a bit more. It all seems to have successfully completed. Hmm. All the tests are green. I wonder what value is returning. Let's just copy that test down and have a look. So, well, it failed because instead of four, it's returning zero. Hmm. Now, it turns out that's actually by design. That's deterministic. We can rely on that. We can actually message any nil object and we'll always get, if there is a return value, we'll always get a zero or nil result. That's baked into the language. It's, it's like the, the null object pattern baked in. And that's because when you when you message nil, you're actually messaging the, uh, the, the class object. And the default implementation there is just to return zero to everything. So that's part of the, the benefit of having that intermediary already. Um, all right. What else can we do? Let's see. Uh, in fact, what I'm going to do is put that into a separate section. Just so we can keep track of it. Ah, right. Now, why did I use the, the duck class at all? Let's see if we can get the... Um, Go. See if we can get our squirrel to quack. So we didn't have a uh, a quack method implemented on squirrel. So would we expect that to even compile? And it does. That's interesting. But if I run it, now it does crash. And in fact, you can see we've got see. Uh, an, ex an exception. Uh, unrecognized selector. So it's not a like a seg fault. This is actually a, a detected uh, violation of our of our interface. It's discovered at runtime and it's given us a nice report. And in fact, this is all because I've used this ID type up here. And this is Objective-C's dynamic type. It can stand in for any type and it gives you some extra functionality. If I change that to a, a fully typed squirrel, we'll actually catch that at compile time. Great, but that's not so interesting. 
Let's put it back to ID. Can we actually get it to respond to the quack? Turns out we can. We're going to need a little bit of help from the Objective-C runtime. So I'm going to include the header for that. And uh, see runtime, there we go. And the way it works is we can get a new method to call a, a function. Um, it was a void function, wasn't it? So I'm going to call it, I don't know, how about the nut quacker? <laughs> right. Now we need at least two arguments to this. First argument is going to be what would be self. So ID for, for that dynamic type. The second argument is that selector. If you remember for the diagram earlier that we, we looked at. Yes. Uh, and the type is cell in Objective-C. If there were any other arguments to the function, we'd just put them here. But there were no arguments, so that's... Uh, that's all we need. But, so, by the way, yeah. I, I wonder if uh, our audience is going to to ask uh, things like, for example, what would be the benefit of um, uh, messaging the nil uh, object, the, the null object? It, because uh, if, I can understand that uh, when we use a, a, a strongly typed language like C plus um, plus, the, the, the match of types uh, would be something that I. It's a hard error that you better uh, discover it at compilation time. But uh, maybe uh, you don't want uh, the program to crash dynamically when 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 the alignment of types uh, doesn't happen at the runtime. That's a good question, and it's really an example of the different uh, approaches to the, to languages and the design of polymorphism. So, Objective C programmers uh, rely on this fact. They they use it all the time. Uh, not as a, a way to just be lazy and uh, hide errors, but actually as part of the way that they they code. They, they rely on the fact that they they don't have to check for nil everywhere. Um, uh -huh. They know there's going to be this default behavior, and they're expecting it, so they work around it. As, as I say, it's, you, you can actually do it in even C++ by explicitly coding like a, a special sentinel type that has that default behavior, yes. but it's, you know, it's a lot of work. Uh, unless, of course, you have a, a handy type erasure library that has it built in. But um, sometimes that's yeah. the behavior you actually want. In, in, in the case of the suit type erasure library, um, the, there is, a, for every affordance, you indicate uh, as a programmer what you want for the default constructed object, which would represent the nil, because a default constructed object doesn't have something in the type erasure container, right? Uh, right. You specify what you, what you want uh, to do, and typically it is like, for example, if you are uh, converting something to string, it's going to return the empty string or thereabouts. So it's right. it's uh, similar. But I'd like to see that maybe maybe a bit later. Let me finish this example. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I will show you momentarily if you want. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, flipping the the presentation to hmm. to some code that I have been working on. So you can see here, um, we've got. Well, it's just a few of them, but we've got quite a few methods that are basically runtime reflection provided by the Objective-C runtime. So I'm going to use add method. I need to provide a class, which I can get from the, uh, the squirrel class. So NS object, that base class, has all these handy methods, um, like getting the, even a class is an object in Objective-C, gets that from, from small talk. Then we need a selector which we can get using the selector directive. Uh, and it was the quack selector we wanted to implement. And now we need an implementation. That's basically a function pointer, but it has to be typed as imp. So we cast that and give it the nut quacker. And this last string, it's just weird encoding of types in a string. So it was a void return, uh, it takes an ID, it's a reference type, all reference types are at, uh, like we saw at the beginning of the string. And then it takes a selector that has no arguments and returns nothing. So we represent that with just a colon. Don't worry too much about the encoding. We just had to put that in there to make that work. That, uh, that, that resembles be... the the the, um, uh, the mangling rules for identifiers that are overloaded in C++. Uh, it, it is like uh, type mang uh, name mangling, mangling, yeah. But it's just purely the types and not the name itself. If I run that. Java also, in Java, you also had to do something similar with an encoding with the class names and and uh, the argument types and so on. Right, yeah. 
well, if you know the rules, they're, they're fairly straightforward. Uh, it just looks a bit weird if, if you don't. But look, we can run it and we can see our message is being printed. So that squirrel now has a quack method. We have made a squirrel quack. Brilliant. With just uh, just one line of code, really, plus the, the method itself. So I think that's that's pretty good. Um, I mean, how, how would you do these things with your framework then? Well, um, I think that uh, before uh, telling you how to do Objective-C in the, in the framework, um, we should talk about a few things that I that I have been thinking about uh, other directions in which uh, the take it or leave it C++ runtime polymorphism might not be what we want uh, to do. And um, I think that uh, we have a few slides uh, for that. Um, so, um, so, so let's go back to, to, to the most important part of it all, okay? We have the idea, uh, like for example, something that quacks, that you want to invoke that behavior of quacking, okay? Uh, that implies a relation of uh, subtyping because uh, there might be uh, the idea of uh, quacking and uh, you can do it like a particular type of doc or a, a different type of doc, et cetera, right? So different behaviors for uh, different interpretations of what is to quack. Yeah. And um, so it, that is what uh, it's commonly referred to as the Liskov substitution principle. Mm -hmm. However, uh, the, like I was telling you a, a bit earlier, the implementation of the concept of subtyping in, in source code has a uh, Subclassing, so like inheriting from a base class or in, even inheriting from an interface, is very heavy handed because mm -hmm. uh, you begin to introduce a lot of formal requirements there that uh, become um, complicated and uh, annoying. And I, I will show you in a minute what I mean by annoying. Uh, but what we want to do is to, to, to achieve subtyping, right? The, the substitution. Could you so, please, uh, yeah. next slide? Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is gonna take us beyond the normal mechanism of uh, inheritance plus virtual in the language, okay? Next, please. There we go. There is a really great presentation that I always link to, which is uh, a inheritance is the base class of evil by Sean Parn. You just Google for this and you're gonna find it. Uh, that's gonna tell you what is the, the problem with the, uh, the canonical runtime polymorphism in C++, which relies on inheritance and virtual. Uh, next. So um, the most important problem, in my opinion, is that it, it, it condemns you to use preferential semantics. And then referential semantics is a world of pain, in my opinion. That's why I named uh, the, the C++ London presentation uh, the pains of runtime polymorphism. So it includes, you have indirections that uh, have a, a, an important uh, performance cost because your runtime is chasing pointers all around. You have to do allocations and that is very typically in, in a world of uh, multi-threading, uh, a nasty synchronization problem. Uh, because you're using pointers and it is expensive to just doing a copy, uh, you have a, a, a uh, an untoward incentive to share state that makes uh, the reasoning not local, constrained to the things, because for example, you cannot have a local variable that retains its uh, runtime polymorphic nature, nor you can have a member. All, all you can have is a reference or a pointer to the thing that is polymorphic. And uh, another very nasty property of uh, or restriction to these things is that uh, it forces you to wrap perfectly valid, well-tested types into something that uh, uses the type that is perfectly good, but mm -hmm. wrapped to adhere to the formal property of inheriting from, from a class or an interface. And that is part of the problem of why uh, inheritance, even from an interface, is a, a heavy-handed approach. Could you please go to the next slide? So, um, there is another problem with uh, the inheritance relation, which is something that uh, I, I am sort of introducing jargon here, so I'm not gonna explain this too much, but uh, I refer the problem has the existence 
of relations of subtyping that are not just monophyletic, like a monophyletic species in the natural world, of the biological species. There are also paraphyletic and uh, polyphyletic uh, uh, relations of, between species, and uh, the relation of subclassing only supports monophyletic. I'm going to explain that when we go to, to runtime polymorphism, but uh, that's basically the idea. Uh, you have been telling us, I am discovering there are many more ways of doing message passing that uh, they just escape what, what you can emulate on a, on a normal way with um, the virtual and uh, inheritance. Next slide. So, uh, one thing that I have learned preparing for, for to talk to our audience is that uh, uh, Alan Kay, the inventor of a small talk and uh, the, probably the inventor of the whole of the object-oriented paradigm, he says that uh, he regrets that uh, the idea that people got was object orientation as opposed to the, the messaging part of it all. Like the, the really important part is uh, the messaging. And you know, has, someone has been uh, working on uh, event processing. Yeah, my focus has been on, on uh, performance decidedly, but uh, um, uh, event processing is how the, the, the components of a system communicate that uh, something happened. And uh, well, that is uh, uh, messaging and very rich mechanisms for messaging are probably very good to reduce the amount of work that you have to do to achieve correctness. And it's gonna get you far in terms of performance. Next slide. All right, so uh, I, I just invite people to the program themselves about uh, conceiving runtime polymorphism as just inheritance and virtual. Next slide. So, um, what is it that we're we're going to be capturing? Um, Arthur O'Dwyer, um, he, he is a, a brilliant blogger, and uh, he wrote that uh, the capabilities that something that does a uh, type erasure, the, the, he provided the jargon of affordance. I think that if you click on next, uh, we're going to see more of this slide. So uh, more. So uh, one of the, the articles that I invite people to, that I always invite people to read is uh, the space of design choices for a standard function. And uh, the reason being that it is very much the subject matter that we're talking about. If you think about a standard function, it is something that allows you to achieve runtime polymorphism because you have the very same type, which is the standard function and substitutability with everything that implements that uh, operator call that uh, you have in the signature of a standard function, right? But then a multitude of, of uh, questions uh, crop up. Like for example, what should be the configuration of uh, the space available for holding the, the object? Should it be a large buffer or should it be a small buffer? And uh, my opinion is in, in general, there is no one size fits all answer. Like uh, the multiplicity of legitimate use cases is very, very diverse. So what we had to support, in my opinion, is uh, diversity, doing the thing of a la carte so that people can pick and choose. I want uh, this property, this property, this property. I don't want to have uh, the thing uh, ever being allocated on the heap. I want uh, that it doesn't uh, take ownership of the, the target, or I want the opposite, that it takes ownership of the target. Um, and uh, uh, many other different choices, like for example, should it have a flavor for the same function call that is const versus the version that is non-const, like in Foley function, or other choices? And, and performance gets involved here and so on. Uh, uh, move on, next. So uh, I claim that uh, any container allows the user to really pick and choose Please, uh, uh, next. And things that uh, O'Dwyer doesn't even mention, okay? And because I am obsessive about performance, uh, honestly, I haven't seen anybody that comes close to, to, to the minutia of performance that uh, 
Well, yeah, and you can see the presentations that I have done on the subject uh, if uh, you want to know more about the details. But let us go back to focus on, on the aspect of uh, choices for runtime polymorphism themselves. Next. Okay, so uh, I think that uh, most of our audience at least is uh, familiar with the concept of doc typing in, in, in Python. So doc typing is if uh, something waddles like a dog, quacks like a dog, uh, swims like a dog, then we don't need that object to formally adhere to a hierarchy of classes or concepts or, or uh, types. We just use it as a dog, period, okay? So um, this has a, a, um, a, a nature that is a, a little bit of ad hoc to it. We don't care about the, the inner properties of the, the types as long as they can do something reasonable. They are reasonable interpretations of what we want uh, them to do. So maybe uh, um, I am going to uh, uh, show people. Uh, well, I think that uh, when we were preparing, you were uh, putting the, the, the code in the slides, yes. right? Excellent. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that's it. Uh, please uh, show me the next slide. That um, so this is something very very typical, which is the need of converting a value that we hold in a type erase container. Therefore, we don't know at runtime exactly what is the type that it has, but we want to do something polymorphic with it, like for example, serialization, converting it to a string. So this is the way that uh, as a, a, a string. Uh, uh, capability would be implemented in the suit type erasure library. So I'm going to very quickly describe what, it, what this is. And uh, I'm very encouraged uh, by uh, the way that uh, you went over this uh, when we were preparing the field, because uh, um, once it clicked for you, then uh, it, it was like a natural and easy to, to, to follow from the perspective of a user, at least. Am I right on that? Yeah, it takes a little while to get to a point where everything comes together because it's quite a few moving parts. But once it does, it's, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, the reason for the moving parts is that you have many, many choices. And uh, when we approach this with a, a simple uh, a restricted understanding of what is exactly what we want to accomplish, like if we have one particular use case, then all of these choices get in the way. But we, when we don't have a particular, uh, uh, we want something that is truly genetic, that is not going to, to, to paint us into a corner that we cannot progress forward, then these choices become relevant. Um, so uh, yes, so um, what an affordant does is in line 154, it decides, it, it declares what is what it needs for the type erasure container, uh, the, the, the same slide, please. The next. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, B table entry is what you're going to put in the B table, typically function pointers, but can be that and are already that superior to the stand, uh, standard feature in the language. And uh, so those are the function pointers that are going to implement the things. But you have to provide uh, functions to put the function pointer to them. And that's what you do on, on default. Default is, what is it that this thing is going to do when the container doesn't have something constructed into it, okay? Like default construction. That would be the equivalent of nil in, uh, in uh, Objective-C. And uh, well, in this particular case, it is just simply going to return the empty string. Operation is far more interesting and uh, all of these things are, are, are templates because we don't know, for example, how the values are going to be handled. We already intuit that uh, there might be the opportunity for the values to be handled locally in a local small buffer, the small buffer optimization, or maybe fall back to allocating on the heap. So that is already fully implemented. But it, this goes beyond that because, for example, I have worked on um, value managers that don't use pointers, but use indices into pre-allocated regions of memory. So the values are handled through, through uh, indices and uh, you achieve properties of relocability, relocatability that uh, I, I want to, to follow up with uh, Bob Steele, but he has always been so busy on that. 
and uh, it, uh, uh, provide a, a, a complete set of polymorphism with relocatability um, using uh, uh, that thing. So there are very few assumptions that we can make about uh, how the values are going to be managed. And uh, that is taken care of by receiving the template parameter of co the concrete value manager. Now, in the, in the actual implementation, we are going to uh, use that concrete value manager to administer in guys affordance implementation. But before we go back to that code, let us complete the, the, the uh, uh, affordance itself. Um, the mixing is a, a component that, uh, in this particular example, is not necessary and is seldom necessary. I don't have only used it for very fundamental infrastructure type things. So I'm just going to skip on, 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 on explaining more what this is. In general, you don't need it. And uh, then there is the part of, okay, what are the things that uh, the type erasure container is going to offer to the users? Because we have been talking about the implementations. But now, what is it that uh, it's going to offer to the users? Well, the users are going to be able to call the method string guys on uh, an, a, any container that contains a, a disaffordance. You can go back to the previous slide so that we can see the implementation. So the string guys affordance implementation in the bottom of the slide uh, is just going to uh, call an, an implementation function string guys and. Uh, uh, all that is going to do is to uh, do this uh, downcasting and upcasting and constcasting to ask the concrete value manager to give the actual value that it is holding, okay? And that is the T in line 138 that gets received. And uh, then it is a, a very straightforward, uh, well, as far as template metaprogramming goes, uh, of uh, you check whether the, the type T has a, a to string uh, uh, value. And well, if it has a to string, then you're just going to use it. And if not, then you're going to uh, point to using the, the inserter operator on a output string. And uh, if that also fails, you can hear complain and throw an exception or refuse to compile or uh, many different choices. Or perhaps since the default is to return the empty string, if you don't know how to string guys something, you just return the empty string. So uh, I think that this is uh, uh, enough. We can uh, go to the next slide. So back to yeah, here. next. Yeah. So um, uh, so what is it that we're doing here? Okay, that we're making a bridge between, for example, the existence of to string or the inserted operator to a, an output stream, which is something of the richness of C++ at compilation time. It is, over load resolution, in my opinion, a very sophisticated me mechanism of pattern matching. And we only, we, we have much more than just over load resolution. We also have template specializations. All of that is available to you. And the bridge is to, use the concrete value manager, it's gonna tell you what is it, what it holds, and then you drag the overloads to the implementations, okay? I, I want people to see that this is not intrusive. We can use an integer, we can use uh, anything that has a to string or, a, or an inserted operator and the implementation is gonna drive it well. So no need to be doing the wrapping of things. So you see, you don't need something that, uh, uh, adheres to a formal property of inheriting from, from a class hierarchy. So this is ad hoc. Um, ad hoc is a, something of a double edge because uh, like people that program in, in, in Python don't benefit from a, a strong types and, and the guarantees of the strong types, for example. And those are good to have just more, perhaps not always. So there has got to be like a way to choose when when uh, a strong typing and uh, adhering to a class hierarchy is more problem than, than what is worth. And that is what I consider to be the benefits of doing things ad hoc uh, once in a while. And that is what, uh, in my opinion, is captured in uh, Python stock typing. We can go to the next slide. Well, um, one property that uh, that uh, you don't lose 
when you use a zoo type erasure is composability. Like a typically a very typical example that uh, has not been well supported in other frameworks that I have seen is uh, this dichotomy, for example, that you want to, just for example, sake, an a standard function that uh, is um, a move only, okay? So it doesn't uh, require a copyability or copy constructor or copy assignment. So that's desirable because for example, you can use a, a Lambda that has a capture that is not uh, a copyable like a, a, a capturing by reference things. Uh, and uh, well, sometimes you want to copy that and you want to require that, right? So there is a very clear subtyping relation that probably merits the very strong subclassing relation. And that is a, a totally supported. Next slide. So how, how are we gonna do this? I'm gonna just uh, reiterate a slide that I put at CPPCon last year. So to, to show people uh, what this is like. So um, uh, let's say that uh, we want to make some reasonable choices for, for a type erased container. Uh, so we can have a normal policy. The policy is the thing that is going to tell the container, the, the type erased container, the capabilities that is going to have the configuration of the local buffer. So the first argument is what is going to be the size and the alignment. So in this particular case, it means please have the local buffer be able to, to hold two void pointers with the alignment of void pointers. And the basic capabilities that I want for it is uh, this normal destructibility, nothing weird there. Because by the way, you can uh, eliminate uh, unnecessary object code size by um, uh, removing the destructor of uh, some global objects that uh, you know that uh, it is pointless to destroy them because uh, when your application is uh, going out, uh, the operating system is just shutting down. So uh, there's no, no point in, in doing that finalization or perhaps you're gonna have a thread joining synchronization problem if uh, those destructors are executed. So uh, you might have a, a, a destruction affordance that does nothing, for example, uh, normal moving and um, a normal RTTI. So please observe that in principle, this is not copyable. And uh, then we have an, any container that is gonna be able to take care of the fundamental operations by um, uh, uh, using that policy, okay? But at, at this point in time, that is not very useful because it is not doing anything um, uh, interesting. It is just taking care of, uh, if uh, you assign it, then uh, it's gonna do the right thing. You can uh, construct it like you would construct a uh, standard any object, et cetera, right? Now, we use a, a, a template adapter that is function, that is the one that uh, privileges one, one call signature for performance. And uh, all of the fundamental operations are gonna be taken care of by the, the type erasure container. So what I say here, order consumer, is something that is a, like a standard function that is able to receive a, a, a call signature messages, but it is not copyable, okay? Next slide, please. But uh, I can very trivially do the flavor of uh, that function that is uh, copy constructible and copy assignable by um, using the, 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 the policy builder that takes an already existing type of container that in this particular case is gonna be the order consumer and adds in new capabilities. In this particular case, only the capability of copying. Next slide. Yes, so uh, at this point, uh, um, I am going to open this in the, in the compiler explorer because uh, uh, I think it is really cool to be able to see that uh, yeah. Uh, all of these things uh, just work. Um, Phil, do you have any question? Do you think that the uh, that the audience is going to be interested in uh, any aspect of uh, what I have been talking so far? Well, I think they're going to love it when they get to see it. 
Now, one thing oh. that struck me was that your um, container that you created here is is basically already better than uh, stood any, and then you trivially show how you can just add copyability. Uh, yes, after indeed. The fact. So let me. Um, uh, I'm gonna boot you to to show you what. Uh, mm -hmm. Please do. I wanted to show you. All right. So, um, do you think the font is uh, large enough? Um, it is for me, but I've got a, a thirty-inch display. You might want to put it up a, a tad. Is that yeah, tad uh, enough? All right. So, uh, what uh, the what you can see in this link is uh, uh, the minimum preprocessing of uh, uh, an example. So. Um, I think uh, that uh, from uh, from uh, this point onward, so uh, up the 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 thirteen hundred lines of code is uh, the pre the preprocessing of uh, the zoo libraries, and uh, okay. um, from this point is like a like a a concrete example. So you can see here that there is a signature. Uh, that that signature is going to be callable with a void pointer as the first argument, and you can go back to my cppconf for why I begin those call signatures with a void pointer, and then it receives uh, four integers. Okay, this is arbitrary. It's just uh, for example, uh, uh, and uh, now we decide that the local buffer is going to be of uh, three integers. We're going to make it destructible and uh, movable. Uh, this is pretty much what I have in the slides and uh, it continues to be uh, like that. Now, let us use it, right? Well, uh, the, the, the function with uh, this signature will allow this type of, no, sorry, uh, this type of callability, okay? Notice that this is a, a function call signature. The, the, the syntax in C++ is always weird. But uh, yeah, this, uh, this parenthesis means that it is a, a function call signature. And it's going to receive a void pointer and some integers. Okay, well, if you had that void pointer and some integers, uh, like a uh, instrument ID, tick side uh, quantity, then you can use the function call uh, on the uh, order consume with uh, those uh, arguments, right? Now, you can have, like I said, this uh, uh, composition. You're going to get incopiable order consumer, everything that the order consumer was able to do plus the capability of copyability, okay? So uh, I can come here and uh, static assert that uh, it is not, that is not copy, uh, a copy constructible and uh, the compiler uh, accepted uh, that static assertion, but I can do the same thing and uh, say that uh, it is indeed copy constructible, the, um, the copyable OC. And just uh, uh, for the audience to see that I'm not cheating or anything. So, well, you can play with this. Uh, uh, the compilation failed, and the reason why it failed is uh, you see that it is uh, already in red. Yeah. But uh, let me show you something that is uh, uh, hopefully interesting for the audience, OK? I can use a copyable order consumer anywhere, anywhere an order consumer is required. And I'm gonna prove that by not invoking it this way, but to use the old function. So you see, invoke order mm -hmm. consumer takes all the arguments and the last argument is a, an order consumer, right? But I'm not gonna Pirates. pass an order consumer. I'm gonna pass the COC, the copyable order consumer that uh, I got uh, in this uh, function call invocation. And that should compile without a problem. Mm. Because you've still got the as copy constructible. 
This is correct. This is correct. Um, oh, yeah. I, I just, uh, uh, I, I just uh, misspelled. There you go. There we go. So, what is the point that I'm driving home? That uh, you have at the right is still very much polymorphic. Yeah, yeah. That uh, is uh, compatible, substitutable. Okay, good thing. Yes. Uh, so um, I'm gonna stop the presentation. Maybe show me what is the next slide uh, by, because. I'll... By the way, if those four integer arguments were template arguments, would it still be able to handle that? Repeat. If those four integer arguments you showed there, if they were templated arguments, would it still be able to handle that, or does it only work with concrete? No, types? because uh, because uh, um, the runtime is uh, like a, a particular projection of the universe of things that are available at uh, compilation time. So the whole point of of uh, of uh, runtime polymorphism, and thank you for. For the, the, the question, because that's a really important one. The whole point of runtime polymorphism is to achieve the genericity without knowing the particular details of what are the arguments that you're receiving. Right. Okay. Um, the, the next thing we wanted to go on to was going to be um, revisiting the Objective C code, which I'm going to do by, I share my screen again. Going to something I prepared earlier. It's not come up, has it? Let's see if I can get that. Here we go. Just needed to refresh. So this was the code that we got to earlier with some extra comments because I'm using one I've fallen back to from source control. Um, if we, yeah, by the way, you have to make sure that you put in the notes for the presentation the links to this uh, I will piece, do that. Uh, in GitHub and, 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 and so on, because yeah. uh, I, I want to be able to go back to, there are too many details. Every time that you explain this, there are so many details that I just feel the need to go back to them. And and I really thank you for for making the effort to, to, to explain this, because uh, uh, from you, I, I, I am learning so much more efficiently that, than I would on my own. Good to know. Thank you. So I wanted to talk about faking and mocking because this sort of dynamic binding is really good for that. So I'm going to introduce a new class, fake squirrel, that um, just re returns a hard-coded number of nuts. So otherwise, it's identical to the way that we've declared other classes, just um, very minimal. So it has the same method, but it, there's no inheritance relationship there. So very similar to what, what you were showing. And again, very similar to what you just showed, actually. To demonstrate it, I've got a function here that takes, say, a squirrel by a specific type. So it's the ID, it's an actual squirrel, and calls number of nuts and just returns it. So we'll create a fake squirrel and we'll pass it to our nut counter. Because fake squirrel is ID, that just naturally converts to squirrel and it calls, calls, us, calls that method on it just because it's uh, it happens to support that method, it's duct typing. Let's um, indeed see that actually run. And well, it all it all passed. <laughs> you can't see the specific uh, example there. But what if the thing that you want to fake or mock out is a singleton? Now we, we tend to shy away from singletons, but they they do exist. And in, in Objective C, they're much more prevalent, especially in the Apple frameworks. They're all over the place. So we have to work with, with mocking singletons. That's where it gets really interesting. So if you remember that, um, let me find the, the call to it, eats method. And I said, we'll, we'll look at that call later. It's calling this nuttery shared instance. And that's that's the singleton. We go through to there, just a classic Maya singleton, static instance, allocates it, returns it. And that's what's returning that one nut per mouthful. So we come back to where we were, back in the tests. So we're going to create a fake nuttery that we can configure how many nuts will return. So that's just all the setup for it. But here's the, the nuts per mouthful method. 
what we want to be able to do is use that as our singleton. But how can we how can we change a singleton that's already there? Because it's a static inside another method. So I've come up with this helper class called a, a singleton injector. Uh, the TBC there is just a, a, a prefix to disambiguate because we don't have namespaces in Objective C. Just look in there and actually we'll look at the implementation. Uh, lots of gnarly stuff, but the important part is we can get these class methods and then we can exchange them. This is what we call method swizzling in Objective C. And it's reasonably well known, not that commonly used in practice technique for doing this advanced stuff. So it's going to exchange those implementations, run the code that's passed in as a lambda, that's the syntax, and then clean up afterwards by swapping them back. So that's what the helper does. So we create our fake nuttery, call our singleton injector with our fake object, inject it into the nuttery class for the shared instance selector, and then run this block of code. So within this block of code, when that eats method calls out to the nuttery singleton, it's gonna get our fake one back. And that's what it's gonna return the number of nuts. So even though this is code we don't control, we've been able to inject our code into it. And as we saw, the tests were passing. So we know that we've got uh, a different number of nuts back than we would have expected previously. So that's that's method swizzling and the swapping methods around at runtime in Objective-C. It's really great for testing. Uh, that's something we, we can't possibly do in C++, right? Yeah, you know, it, it, uh, I, I, I know the little of Objective-C that I know, basically thanks to, to the preparation that I've had with you, but uh, it, this problem of uh, injecting a dependency in a singleton is something that I have, it's a wall that that has been, I have been hitting over and over and over when I'm doing testing, when I am doing performance analysis. It's it's really, really difficult to uh, to get around. You basically have to do a, a full blown on re-architecture of a system so that you can inject the dependency that you want for for particular use cases. But I've been thinking about how to implement this in um, in the the SU type erasure library, and um, it, I have found a, a way to do something that uh, I hope is valuable, and, and it has an interesting part, an inter, an interesting property to it, which is, you know, as you know. It, it, you can see that, that uh, I have been presenting uh, um, about uh, this uh, type of ratio framework uh, since uh, 2018, I think, uh, when I went uh, to Chicago and, and the C++ mm -hmm. users group in Chicago and, and uh, I kept on working on that, right? So you might think that at this point in time, then it will be completely finished. But in reality, uh, I, I am... Uh, with especially with more use like the, the use had snap, uh, this has presented many new challenges that are outside of what you normally do with C++ and they become like a breakthroughs to 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 improve the whole the whole uh, framework uh, and take it to 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 the next level that's why I, I talk about uh, the generations on the type ratio framework currently what is public available is a uh, generation number two and uh, uh, with uh, expression templates and other things I'm going to be doing uh, the generation three, probably incorporating more a la carte uh, 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 runtime polymorphism features. But there's one thing that uh, it is a very tough to comprehend example, so I'm not going to insist too much on it, but just for the in the interest of uh, uh, showing to people um, uh, I, I, I hope if, if you let me feel to mm, yeah. um, present uh, uh, some complicated uh, template metaprogramming code that uh, do. We, we to love do that, complicated okay? template metaprogramming code here. Yeah. Yes. So um, let me um, remove this and just put a null pointer because uh, if you remember of the Eastern guys, uh, affordance, the bitable entry point that uh, it required was a function pointer. So I'm just going to put a, a null pointer. But uh, this is what uh, I am envisioning has a, a limited, but hopefully still useful version of a uh, method swizzling. So I have a mm -hmm. function swizzle. 
And uh, I'm going to tell you that uh, what Swizzle is, this invocation of the function Swizzle, so this is a template function, there is the template arguments, and uh, this is the argument. I will go over them momentarily. Uh, by the way, is the font uh, good enough? I think so, just about. Um, the um, uh, invocation is going to work on the string guys affordance for values of, uh, for held values of integer, it's gonna change the behavior of that affordance when the held object is an integer. In this particular case, the change of behavior is that it's going to explode, but uh, well, that's a change of behavior. Uh, it's the, 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 the simplest uh, change of behavior that I can explain because we want to focus on how to change the behavior as opposed to what the change behavior should be. Um, Type in null object pattern. Huh? A different type of null object pattern. <laughs> the, um, and the replacement is something that resembles an affordance that it provides an operation, which is a template that that says what is it that the affordance is going to do when when uh, um, it is uh, required, when, when it is executed, OK? Mm -hmm. And well, um, the um, let me uh, change the indentation here. So this is an any container in this example that uh, has uh, the normal uh, affordances. So uh, the local buffer would be the size and alignment of a void pointer. Okay. Uh, it's uh, normally destructible, normally movable. Ah, but it also has the string guys affordance, so it, it can be converted to 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 string. And I call that C of a container. And that is what I am passing to the Swizzle, OK? So okay. Um, this is when people run for the hills, but uh, it's OK because we're about to finish the presentation. So I, I, I'm not so so worried about uh, at this point. Uh, by the way, you, you had done a great job explaining your thing, sir. Um, uh, Swizzle receives the object. But it takes a, a multitude of uh, template arguments, OK? The affordance that is being swizzled, the object type, which is the container. Oh no, no, sorry. The, the object type is in this case integer. The the what we want, what type we want the replacement to apply for, the mechanism for replacing, and uh, the actual container type. Because you know, this can be any type of container, the one that is relocatable, for example, or the one that is normal heap or local buffer. Um and uh, for that guy, we call some implementation detail that I am calling right now a modify virtual table. And modify virtual table is implemented using the, the, the spirit of uh, functional programming of uh, not modifying everything. Everything is immutable. You just create a, a new version in which you make a substitution, but it is an entirely new thing in which you change something by creating something that uh, is almost identical except a, a, a difference. It returns the modified thing. Yes, uh, it builds the modified thing. So it doesn't modify anything. It just builds something new that has the modification in. Right. Um, object container change. This is where the newbie table is uh, uh, being changed. And uh, then there is the complication of how we're going to implement that. And I'm just going to tell you in one minute, because uh, this is not something that uh, we should spend a lot of time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, but uh, I promise uh, 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 I won't monopolize this on, on the details. Basically, what we want to do is a template that uh, it is uh, giving us the normal vtable entry for the things that we are not modifying and it's going to give us the modification for the affordance that we're modifying. And that is accomplished by this template that I call normal or replaced, that ends up driving operational replacement. And um, operational replacement is going to take a value manager, it's going to take an affordance, the affordance being swizzled, and a replacer. So this would use the operation on the affordance. So it would do the, the normal thing. and. Uh, if you see, this is uh, the definition of that template, and this is a partial specialization. Oh, sorry, I over, I highlighted too much. This is a partial specialization, 
For the case in which uh, the affordance that you are getting the V table entry is the same as the affordance being swizzled. So right. in this particular partial specialization, I'm gonna invoke the replacer. So the syntax is such that you can make two flavors of an affordance, like for example, two flavors of a string, a string guys, and then use one flavor in the Swiss link, in the Swiss link. And uh, um, I am going to compile it in uh, Xcode and uh, it's going to succeed. And um, yeah, I'm going to change names here and so on. So uh, I'm probably going to have a radically different uh, way of approaching this by the time that I publish it. But uh, this is an example of the things that I'm working on for the public version of the repository because uh, um, uh, I, I, yeah. Well, um, I hope that was uh, of interest. Yeah, I'm really impressed that you managed to put together an implementation of method switching, even if it's not the final version, just in the last couple of days, using the, the, the toolkit that you've built up in, in your framework, already using that sort of really extreme form of single responsibility principle. That's really paid off, I think. Yes, yeah, but uh, it's, it's, you know, like, like I was telling everybody at uh, C++ London, uh, um, I, this is the most radical way that I have ever followed the single responsibility principle. But I am noticing that 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 uh, it creates a fundamental problem that I was not aware I hadn't experienced before, which is in the in the SUTA ratio framework, everything has at least at, 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 at the most one responsibility. So it is going to be able to do only one thing. So it does nothing. Every element either does nothing or does one thing. But that optionality means that uh, every time that you want to trace in your in your mind what are the things that might be going on, there is an orchestration of so many things that are there only yeah. so that potentially you can use them that uh, it is a very hard barrier to penetrate through. And uh, well, I'm studying this and, and, and learning a lot from, from improving the, but I think that all of this is for good reason because this orthogonality is what allows you to have, for example, the value managers are completely unrelated to the implementation of the affordances. And that relieves the users from a mountain of work that they otherwise would have to do because uh, the things would be entangled. They, they, they will have uh, nasty interactions in between them. And you have the, the like I, I, I showed people of uh, the implementation that I have of Sue function, doesn't even concern itself with type erasure. It receives something that provides the fundamental operations, constructability and assignability, so that it can focus on delivering on the performance invocation to the privileged call signature. Right. But, but these are things that, that you cannot do with the, the plain vanilla language, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Simply, you can't. No, absolutely. It's a great advert for SLP. But I think we're going to need to move on if we're going to get through this before the start of our talk. So <laughs> I'm, going to, yes. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the slides. Hopefully you can see that. Back to that, that language tree. We looked at some of the, the historical languages that have influenced C++ and, uh, and in some ways not influenced C++. But also now we, we have many modern languages that have taking things even further forward. So I'm going to pick on two, uh, Rust and Swift. And Swift is an interesting one because you can sort of trace its lineage back through Objective-C. It's uh, the successor to Objective-C in uh, the Apple ecosystems. But although it does borrow some features, in fact, some of the, the more unusual features it borrows from Objective-C, um, it looks much more like the, the C++ family of languages in, in syntax. It looks a bit more familiar, but it's got some other interesting features to it. So just to talk a little bit about Swift, one reason that C++ programmers might be particularly interested in Swift is because of its uh, the, the people involved in creating it. So it's originally created by Chris Latner at Apple. He's no longer at Apple, but he was, was there when he created it. He also created originally uh, LLVM and Clang. So then went on to, to create Swift, which of course is also built using LLVM. Um, but then there's this guy. You may recognize this photo from the, 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 the Boost. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Exception guarantees Dave Abrams. 
absolutely yeah yeah the uh exception guarantees um but boost consulting prominent member of the boost community and the, and the standards community for many years until he sort of dropped off the radar when he went to to work on apple and and he's popped up on the the swift team as a, as a big advocate of um so i'll talk about it in a minute actually um and it doesn't stop there it's got doug gregor another prominent member of the c plus plus community went to work at apple and has ended up a core part of the the swift team as well so quite quite a rich heritage and many other well-known C++ people have uh, brought their ideas there. I think that Doug Gregory is a, sorry to interrupt, I think that Doug Gregory is the original author of a boost function that eventually became a standard function. Right, you, you may well be right there, I, I forget, could be. But Dave Abrams, um, he has become famous in Swift circles for championing something called protocol-oriented programming in Swift. And he did an excellent talk at uh, WWDC a few years ago, uh, introducing it in a uh, very engaging way. Um, and he also talked about some of the, the advantages of protocol-oriented programming, which uh, you, you might recognize from some of the things we've been talking about today, particularly uh, looking at value types, um, not uh, being intrusive into the type, not monolithic, that sort of thing, retroactive modeling. Well, we'll look at what that means in a moment. So. Best way to explain what protocol oriented programming is, I think, is to drop to another quick demo. So I'm going to stop that screen share and start. Do you think that we're another. doing too many demos that uh, the audience is going to be overwhelmed? Absolutely. Well, okay. Uh, I hope that the recording is good because <laughs> yeah. people are going to have to go back to, to revisit this. If we didn't uh, lose them, uh, uh, Talking of losing them, I'm losing the window that I'm meant to be sharing. I think that's the one. There we go. So this is a Swift playground, which is an excellent tool as part of Xcode for just playing with, with Swift in an immediately invoked environment. And I've got a couple of protocols here. So protocol, it actually borrows that term from Objective-C, and it's what we tend to think of as an interface, uh, at least on the surface. That, that's what it is. So think of these as a square interface and a circle interface. Um, th these are methods, but they're actually properties, so they, they look like fields, but just the, the getters, but that's syntax. You should be able to follow what, that, what that's doing. Uh, in fact, let me make that bigger. Hope that's still oh, yeah, sharing. Better. Yeah, great. <clears throat> um, now let's introduce a square peg. So it's a struct. Uh, we have structs and classes. Um, structs are typically value types, like in, in C Sharp. And we will implement the square protocol and we'll give it a um, an instance variable size. So that automatically implements that protocol. So that's one difference straight away. An instance variable can implement a property on a protocol. Um, and now we're going to have a, a round hole with a single method fit that takes any circle shaped thing. So anything that implements the circle protocol and we'll just print out the radius. So far, so good. All pretty standard OO stuff. All right, let's create a square peg with a certain size. Now, let's try and fit that square peg into the round hole. So square peg, there we go. Yeah, this is just a, a, a going to mathematics so that you tell the mathematicians how to do uh, the squaring of the circle. Absolutely, or yeah, yeah. The circling of the square, perhaps? Well, we'll, we'll do some maths in a moment, so. Um, yeah, it's complaining that um, square square peg does not implement the the the, uh, the circle protocol. Great, you know we've got strong typing. There are advantages to that. So we're not looking at duck typing here. Swift is not a dynamic language, but what you can do is we can write an extension to the square peg struct, and that extension can not only add methods, but it can also add uh, protocols. So we can make it now conform to the circle protocol. So we'll just um, grab that radius method property, sorry, and write that here. And we're going to return, so here's the maths. So two times size squared and take the square root of that. 
should give us a radius of a circle that encloses the square. Um, I won't go into the reasons why that's the case. You should be able to work it out. And let's see if that catches up, compiles. Sometimes playgrounds just takes a little while to catch up. Might have to restart it. Let's try that. Oh, there we go. It fit with a radius of 59. Great. So we, we managed to fit a square peg into a round hole using protocol oriented programming. So I hope you get the idea that it's like um, implementing interfaces, but you can do a lot more with it. And I've only touched on uh, the, the surface of it. But we also did it with, with value types, which was an interesting aspect to it. So that's protocol oriented programming in, in Swift. Do you do anything like that in, in Zoo? Uh, not yet. You mentioned uh, on passing the issue of value semantics, and uh, maybe I, I, I don't remember having said it uh, explicitly, but uh, in so things are value semantics and uh, still polymorphic in this in, in very much the same way that uh, you have uh, uh, value semantics in a standard function. Mm -hmm. What do I mean by that? That uh, you can have local variables that retain their polymorphism. Like uh, you can have a standard function that gets initialized to some type of target and uh, the very same standard function, then you initialize it or, or assign it to some other type of target and you're gonna be invoking uh, the right uh, type of target. Uh, so you can have a local variable that right. retains the polymorphism and in the same way you can have a, a class member, an instance member that uh, uh, retains the polymorphism that you don't have to to use the standard functions, you are not forced to use the standard functions through pointers or references. They can they can be a, a local or, or or instance members. For, but in Sue, of course, you can make up a, a policy that uh, will reject uh, at compilation time, for example, types that uh, won't fit into the local buffer, so that you had the guarantee that it won't even uh, fall back to to the allocation on the heap. So you don't even have the performance cost of the indirection. Uh, you can also make it so that uh, you have, a, 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 your own system has a different, uh, any containers with different sizes and different policies and uh, ways to make the, the conversion optimal between them. So, so this is all made in in in, uh, in the spirit of uh, letting people uh, uh, choose the features that they want, as opposed to to yeah. starting from what are the choices that make sense. Because we don't know. It is like C plus plus itself. C plus plus is multi paradigm because it doesn't know what is the the, the one true paradigm, right? So, mm. with the level of understanding that I have of runtime polymorphism, all I can tell you is that. Uh, the hard uh, universal answers seem to be non-existent. So there was another demo I was going to do in Swift, but I don't think we'll, we'll have time for to uh, to use some types. So a bit like std variant, but uh, with better support in the language. Also, we have std variant in C++, but I know that your library handles some types uh, as well. But I'm, yes. I'm going to have to skip on because I also wanted to get to a um, a quick Rust demo. Um, I can find where I put that. Yeah, so um, originally I wanted to talk about uh, JavaScript because I think that the model of uh, prototypal inheritance in in uh, JavaScript is uh, a very powerful. Um, it is just that uh, um, I think that, that uh, we have already provided so many different examples of programming techniques applicable about uh, runtime polymorphism that uh, we will be beating to death, the belaboring too much the point that we're trying to make, which is that uh, we have to be able to benefit from the runtime polymorphism of other languages. Right. I think I can just very, very quickly run through this Rust demo because it's mostly the same as the, the Swift demo in that we've got the square and the circle and the round hole. But in Rust, we have traits with a set of protocols and they can act very similarly. They have most of the same properties, but they can do other things as well. Uh, the round hole fit is 
pretty much the same. Got a square peg. But what's interesting is I've added this extra method perimeter to square and circle. And what you do in, in Rust is you implement a, a trait for a particular type. So this is sort of like protocol extensions. But what's interesting is the extra perimeter. If we come down to the, the code that's, that's running it, um, well, we can see that we fit our square peg into a round hole, exactly the same technique as before. But the perimeter, because there's two, now two different types of perimeter, one for the circle, one for the square, we have to disambiguate it. And you can actually do that in Rust. You can either cast it, which is a little bit ugly. You don't tend to do that very much idiomatically in Rust. Or you've got this special syntax where you call the, the trait method as if it was an external free function. So this is like a um, universal function call syntax. I think they even call it that still. You can <clears throat> either call the, uh, the function with the, the self parameter first or call it as a method. Uh, you could do it either way and it results to the same thing. But this way around, you can explicitly name the, the trait that you're calling it on. So again, it's more of an evolution rather than a radically different approach. But just another example of um, some of the extra things that you can do in other languages. And, and I think you can do something similar to that in, in the old zoo library as well, can't you? Yes. You, uh, however, it, this, uh, there's an aspect here to, to um, that, that is interesting that uh, it, it prevents uh, uh, accidental name clashes because, uh, uh, like, uh, dog typing absolutely relies on uh, the names having the same meaning on uh, different types, right? Uh, yeah. In the zoo libraries, the um, issue might be uh, more of the kind of that. Uh, the indices into the virtual table had to have the same meaning for things to work. And uh, um, uh, I'll have to, to incorporate this disambiguation mechanism so that uh, you can have things that uh, uh, have the same index with different meaning. Right, yeah. Yeah, so by default, but, but, yeah, but, but, so, 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 this, this is a, work. A, a more general uh, thing than um, the, the 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 selector, the, the mapping of selectors to implementations is far more general than uh, this disambiguation in Rust. So I'm going to focus more on the on the true message passing. Yeah, we are going to have to wrap up. I think otherwise we're not going to have time to start our talk. <laughs> so let's yes. I just whiz through the we've already done those bits now. I think we'll have to skip the JavaScript demo. Yeah. Unfortunately. Too much. And I'll leave it on the last slide. And I know you've got a few final words you wanted to say. Um, uh, uh, other than that, I love okay. your Bitmoji. Thank you for making one for the <laughs> presentation. Uh, I think that uh, we have tortured uh, ourselves too much already. And um, we had to save some energies for the audience. Right. Well, I um I'm gonna put um all the sort of references and, and URLs and things on my website, levelofindirection.com um coming up. But I'll yeah. normally put a, a URL for it there, but I didn't get a chance to do that. But However, yeah, um, I, I really advise you to go to Alexander Bacherikov's uh, presentation tomorrow that um he, he, prom he promises that uh, it's gonna be a very insightful on, on something truly useful that reduces a lot of work. I will do that. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll put the link to those references in uh, the Discord as well uh, when I've got that ready. But just in yes. case there was anybody tuning in early, uh, thanks for listening. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your attention.